What's up everybody? Dr. Rossi, board certified psychiatrist, here to bring you another mental health video. And today's topic is one that's near and dear to my heart because it's something that I have to do on a daily basis and something that I've had to do throughout training. So if you work in an emergency department, then 2.6% of the encounters you have there are going to involve acute agitation. And if you are an emergency psychiatrist or an inpatient psychiatrist, you're gonna to need to know how to treat those clinical situations. So if you are interested in keeping the patient safe, keeping the staff that's working under you safe, as well as keeping yourself safe as the clinician, then you're going to want to know what medications to use, how to use them effectively, and what to do when somebody becomes agitated. It can be a really scary situation to be in. So today I'm going to discuss all of the options for the treatment of acute agitation in clinical practice. Before we start discussing treatment of agitation, we should know what agitation is. So agitation is considered an extreme form of arousal with increased verbal and motor activity that results in the patient becoming a danger to themselves or others. So that's the key component is that this extreme form of arousal ends up going in the direction of danger, dangerousness to self and others. This agitation is going to need to be recognized early and quickly, and you're going to need to immediately address it before harm comes to the patient or the staff that are treating the patient. What is the first thing you're going to do when somebody becomes agitated in the inpatient or emergency setting? The first thing to do is of course talk to that individual. Try to elicit a reason for the agitation. You should be thinking about things like, is the person hungry? Are they tired? Are they overstimulated by a busy emergency room setting that's making them more agitated than they otherwise would be? Now, if these interventions are unsuccessful and the patient remains agitated to the point where it's appearing like they're becoming dangerous to themselves or others, you may need to intervene a little bit further. And something like that might look like bringing security staff, security and nursing staff as a team into the room and alerting the patient that, hey, if this agitation continues and we are afraid for your safety or our staff safety, we are going to have to intervene with medication, letting them know that this is a very serious situation. So before any medications are administered, before anything else is done, a physician-led team should talk to the patient and try to elicit a reason for the agitation. Unfortunately, sometimes medication is unavoidable. So if you've done all the things that I suggested at the beginning of this video and it's still not working and now you are sure that this person is going to be a danger to themselves or others, you may be required to start a medication or use a medication in that setting. Now, of course, there's risk to using sedating medications. These medications have side effects and risks. The main side effect or risk is usually things like hypoxia, airway obstruction, QTC prolongation, low heart rate, as well as low blood pressure. So these are things that we want to be mindful of when we're administering these medications that there is the potential for those things, however rare they may be. Now, if a patient is over the age of 65, if they're intoxicated with alcohol, and if they've had multiple administrations of sedating medication already, there's increased risk for adverse events. So we want to be prepared for those in the event they occur. Let's take a brief second to talk about routes of administration. So the first route of administration that should be offered to a patient, provided they are able to be talked to and they're not so dangerous that something is going to happen immediately, is you can offer them PO medication or oral medication by mouth, knowing that this medication is going to take a little bit longer to take effect. So if you need something that's gonna work really rapidly and you're really concerned about safety, this may not be the best option. However, if the person is reasonable, you can talk to them a little bit and they're willing to take medication, that's going to be your starting point. So in the event that somebody has, say, a psychotic aggression, they're delusional, they're paranoid, and they're becoming aggressive because they think people are trying to harm them, you might offer them something like two milligrams of lorazepam combined with two milligrams of risperidone. So that could be an option. If that doesn't work and the person can't be talked to, then you'll have two other potential routes of administration. You could give IV medication if the person has an IV, so that's common on the medical floor, for example, when someone becomes agitated, they might rip their IV out, or they may have one in and they're starting to become agitated and you will still have access. So you could go intravenous or you could go intramuscular, each of which is going to be much quicker than the PO formulations in terms of it taking effect 
and reducing the agitation leading to sedation. So you're going to want to think about this and you're going to want to use your clinical judgment based on the severity of the agitation and the dangerousness of the situation. Let's talk about our first medication, and this is an oldie but a goodie, and it's going to be, if you work in medicine, you hear about it all the time for the treatment of agitation, and that is haloperidol. So haloperidol is an older, first-generation, high-potency, antipsychotic or dopamine-blocking medication that is commonly used to treat acute agitation. Now, typically, we dose this medication anywhere from 2.5 milligrams for, say, elderly folks or smaller people, all the way up to 10 milligrams in a single dose, depending on the circumstances and, again, severity of the agitation we're trying to treat. Now, typically, the maximum dose for the day will be 20 milligrams per day. So if you use 10 milligrams up front, you only have two doses to give, which could be a problem. The average time to sedation is about 30 minutes, and the average duration of sedation is around two hours. So this will last for up to two hours. The main risk to using haloperidol is going to be EPS, extrapyramidal symptoms, specifically something like an acute dystonic reaction. To avoid this, we commonly combine haloperidol with two other medications. It's usually combined with lorazepam, one to two milligrams, as well as diphenhydramine, also known as Benadryl, in a dose of 50 milligrams or 25 milligrams, again, depending on the clinical scenario and the particular patient you're working with. So this is a good first line option for the treatment of acute agitation with a lot of research and years of research behind it. What about the second generation dopamine blocking medications? Well, one that comes up all the time in the acute setting is going to be orlanzapine. Because it comes in both an IM and IV formulation, it also comes in PO formulation in the form of Zytus, which is a disintegrating tab, which can also be useful in the acute setting. Now, orlanzapine reaches its peak concentration in 15 to 45 minutes. It has a half-life of two to four hours. So the incidence of EPS with orlanzapine is going to be much lower than those first-generation medications I talked about, specifically haloperidol. So less risk for dystonic reactions, for example. Now, there is some evidence that 10 milligrams of orlanzapine is superior to five milligrams of haloperidol in the fact that it is more sedating and that it works faster than haloperidol. In many cases, people were adequately sedated in 15 minutes after administration of 10 milligrams of orlanzapine compared to five or 10 milligrams of haloperidol. So orlanzapine, IM, or IV can be a good option for somebody in the acute setting. Ziprazidone is a second generation dopamine blocking medication that's not often thought about as a medication that you would go to in the acute setting. And that's because the PO version, the oral version of the medication, really serves no benefit in that setting. It's not going to work fast enough, it's not going to induce much sedation, and therefore it is not going to be a good option for somebody who is acutely agitated. However, there is an IM formulation of Zoprazidone which works quite well for acute agitation. The time to onset of this medication is actually quite rapid. So the onset will be anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes, and what you're going to find is it reaches a peak concentration in 30 to 45 minutes. Now the duration of sedation is a little bit longer here than haloperidol. It's going to last up to four hours. So again, fast onset, lasts up to four hours, the big risk with zeprazidone that everybody's going to talk about is the risk for QTC prolongation. So therefore, it's a little bit less favorable. But this QTC prolongation seems to be somewhat overstated in the literature. And, you know, you can do your due diligence. And you might already have an EKG on that individual to see whether or not there's any risk. So having an EKG, giving this medication, and looking out for the risk of QTC prolongation is going to be important when using ziprazidone. Risperidone for acute agitation is a little bit limited, but I do like it in cases where somebody is not quite severely agitated and is willing to take medication, and of course the agitation is driven by, say, psychotic symptoms. So if the agitation is being driven by psychotic symptoms and they're willing to take PO medication, you could administer two to four milligrams of risperidone, and see how the person responds to it. 
It's a good option for patients with psychotic agitation. It's also a good option for elderly and pregnant patients who can take PO medications. So Risperdone should be something to keep in mind when treating agitation. Benzodiazepines, another great option for the acute treatment of agitation. So I've already kind of told you guys that we often combine these medications when we can. So benzodiazepines by themselves though can also be administered if that's what you prefer to do and you maybe want to try that before you try other options. So this is a rapid treatment for acute agitation. Now benzodiazepines carry a couple of risks. One important one is that in elderly patients it can cause a paradoxical effect in up to 1% of patients. What I mean by that is instead of it having a sedating effect on these individuals, it actually has the opposite effect. They become more agitated, they become more ramped up, the psychomotor uh, agitation and talking and everything increase. Everything goes up. It does the opposite of what it's supposed to do is the bottom line. Now, in those cases, you can use a medication called flumazenil to reverse the effects. And the things we want to watch out for with benzodiazepines in general is respiratory depression. We know that if somebody's on a central nervous system depressant already, and then you give them a benzodiazepine, there is that risk that they're going to have worsening respiratory depression, which can be a significant problem, but luckily we're equipped to handle it in the emergency department. Now, if withdrawal is suspected, if somebody is suspected to be withdrawing from benzodiazepines or withdrawing from alcohol, then obviously benzodiazepines are the treatment of choice in those cases. Let's talk about one of my favorite benzodiazepines for acute agitation, and that's going to be the medication lorazepam. Now, lorazepam is great because it doesn't have any active metabolites, it has a moderate half-life, and it really works well for the treatment of acute agitation. Now the doses typically are anywhere between 0.5 milligrams and two milligrams at a time. It can be administered PO, IM, or IV. So there's three different routes of administration that you could use here. And you can use this every 30 minutes up to a maximum dose of 12 milligrams per day. And on top of that, the average time to adequate sedation is only 32 minutes. So again, this is a very favorable medication with a good side effect profile. It's going to be highly useful in combination, as a standalone, and of course in these emergency and inpatient settings. Another benzodiazepine that I often go to is midazolam. Now midazolam is available in an IM formulation and the typical dosing is anywhere from 2 to 5 milligrams. The average time to sedation is very, very short. It's the shortest of the medications we've really talked about here. It can sedate people in 13 to 18 minutes, so the time to onset is very short for the IM formulation. When given IM, the total time of sedation is 82 to 105 minutes, and what you can see that is very favorable here is its onset is rapid, and the time that the person spends sedated is a little bit lower than some of the other medications that we've talked about. Now, midazolam also works faster than haloperidol and zoprazidone, and its duration of sedation, again, is going to be shorter than those two medications, so you might want to start with midazolam as your first option for the treatment of acute agitation. So as I've said to you guys before, in most cases, medications are going to be combined because the combination of medications not only addresses potential side effects like EPS, extrapyramidal symptoms, but it also works synergistically together to induce more sedation and control of that agitated behavior. Now the most well known of these is the one that I've talked about many times to you guys and that is the so-called B52 and again that all helps you to remember the doses of the medication. So it's 50 milligrams of diphenhydramine so that you can avoid EPS symptoms. It's 5 milligrams of haloperidol and it's 2 milligrams of Ativan or lorazepam. So this combination works really, really well. And in most cases, that's going to be more than enough to sedate most individuals. So the I often combine those medications together and will use this quite often in the inpatient setting or the emergency room setting should I need to use it. Sometimes I'll also combine chlorpromazine with diphenhydramine. I do not combine chlorpromazine with lorazepam, so there's no benzodiazepine with chlorpromazine. And also another thing to be mindful of 
is you do not want to combine benzodiazepines with orlanzapine. So you do not want to give your lorazepam and orlanzapine together. When you're using orlanzapine, you're only using orlanzapine alone or in combination with diphenhydramine. For PO medications, risperidone can be combined with PO, lorazepam, and diphenhydramine if needed, or just risperidone and lorazepam if you prefer. I will usually give this alone, not necessarily with the lorazepam or diphenhydramine when I'm using risperidone. What about really, really special rare cases? So I had two clinical scenarios that were personal experiences for me where an individual was given sedating medication, they were also placed in physical restraints, but they were not becoming sedated and they were fighting against the restraints excessively to the point that we were concerned that they were going to have rhabdomyolysis and cause significant problems for themselves medically. So we wanted to try to do something to help these individuals to calm down. And because I was out of options, I had tried all the medication combinations I knew and the person still was very agitated. We decided to use dexmedetomidine or Presidex. So dexmedetomidine or Presidex. So what we did was transfer these individuals to the medical floor and we used Presidex the same way they would in the ICU for sedation when somebody is intubated in critical condition. So this medication worked really, really well. And in many cases, the outcomes were extremely favorable. Not only did it calm the agitation, but in some cases, individuals were able to be discharged from the hospital after becoming after calming down and relaxing. So this medication was very very successful so much so that somebody has now come up with a oral or PO formulation of it. It's called Ilgami and this medication has been out for a while. It's FDA approved now. So dexmedetomidine is an option for acute agitation and now we're lucky enough to have it in a sublingual film that can just be administered to the patient that way instead of using a Presidex drip. So no discussion of agitation in the emergency setting, medical setting, inpatient setting is complete without talking about physical restraints. Now physical restraints may be necessary when safety is a major concern. In some cases, verbal de-escalation and medications are simply not enough. I know I've been there myself looking at these situations, treating these situations, so I can tell you firsthand, sometimes we fail to induce the type of sedation we need, even with medication. And so physical restraints are the only way to keep the patient safe and to keep the staff and yourself safe as well. The problem with physical restraints is that they lead to injury for both the patient and staff. When somebody is going into physical restraints, they're often fighting against them. So staff can be kicked, punched, spit on, bit, etc. I've seen most of those things happen personally. Now, when the person continues to fight against these restraints, they can actually cause severe breakdown of their muscles, so-called rhabdomyolysis, and this can be a significant problem for your kidneys because these breakdown products of the muscle damage the kidneys and can cause problems that lead to medical admission to the medical floor. So we really want to avoid physical restraints at all costs. We want to try to have a zero physical restraints policy, but again, sometimes these things are not possible. And whenever somebody is going into restraints, they should always be given sedating medications at the same time, because again, we want to avoid the risk of that muscle breakdown and the complications associated with it. So in conclusion, guys, agitation, what's the deal? It's a multifactorial process that requires quick decision-making and quick intervention to avoid harm to the patient or others. To maintain safety, agitation needs to be quick, quickly identified and you need to quickly intervene if needed. Verbal de-escalation should always be your starting point. You should also use comfort measures such as getting the person food, getting the person a drink, a warm blanket, trying to create a low stimulus environment by potentially lowering the lights or making things a little bit quieter in the room. All of those things should be your starting point. If medications are required, there are several good options that can be used either individually or in combination to treat severe agitation. And that will be based on your clinical scenario and the severity of the situation. When all else fails, obviously we have physical restraints. We try not to use them. We try to have a zero restraints policy, but sometimes this does not work out and we have to do these things unfortunately. 
So with that said, guys, I think I covered the expert's guide to treating agitation. We went through a lot of material here. If you guys have comments, please drop them below. It really helps me to know that these videos are helpful for you. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel already, please consider doing so. It, again, helps me to know that you guys are getting value from what I'm putting out here. So thanks again, and I will see you in the next video.